Uh, hey everyone, I'm Tejas. Uh, I debated for India at WSDC a couple of years ago, um, and I'm now a college student. And I'm here to talk about the things that I've learned doing debates about animal welfare, um, and also setting debates about animal welfare and judging them quite a lot, um, because those debates have become really popular recently. Uh, I've been involved in the animal welfare space for a long time. Most recently, I was an intern um, at a nonprofit on their animal welfare team. And in fact, the first ever time I made the finals of a debate tournament was on a topic related to animal welfare. Um, and so I have a lot of personal connections with this, um, and I hope I can make this lecture interesting and exciting. Uh, before I begin, I just want to one brief observation about why this lecture is important. And I think it's really useful, especially if you're a debater in the world school format, but also you know, a BP debater for two reasons. The first is that I've observed that animal welfare topics have become really common in debating, especially over the last two years, in a way that I don't remember them being as common before. So the most recent World Schools Debating Championship in 2021 had two different animal welfare related topics. So in the same competition, one in an in round and one in the partial double octave final. Um, and it's very rare for WSTC or any major competition to have two topics about the same subject um, at one tournament. And so I think it's reflective of the fact that animal welfare is becoming an increasingly important issue for schools debaters. So many prominent pre-WSDC tournaments like Oxford WSDC last year and Saskatoon WSDC had animal welfare topics. And I think so it's super useful just to understand how to debate these things. But second of all, I think animal welfare is an excellent way to learn how to make more general good arguments about social movements. Because the animal welfare movement or the animal advocacy movement is in a really interesting place where it's kind of at the beginning of a social movement. So it has a lot of features of historical social movements, like the fact that people can't really agree on whether animal welfare is important at all, which is not true of, say, some other social movements where maybe people agree with the general premise of the social movement and disagree with its approach. And the fact that animal welfare basically only began in 1975 with the release of the book Animal Liberation means that you can, with the animal welfare movement, look at it and learn a lot about how social movements develop on other issues and how to debate uh, anything related to social movements whatsoever. So it's a really good little experiment to understand how to make a social movement effective and how to fail. And there's some other excellent lectures on animal welfare and debating. I highly recommend uh, Lewis Bollard's lecture for Korea Worlds, which is on YouTube. But I think the lecture is gonna be pretty different in the sense that it is much more focused on debating. Um, so I'm gonna focus in this lecture, first on the types of arguments that you will make in animal welfare debates. So I'm going to go deep on examples of specific arguments on specific topics that I've seen set at tournaments before to give you some kind of impression of how arguments on animal welfare debates often work. Second, I'm also going to give you tips about strategy. So what types of cases you should have done and when you should run those cases. So I'm not just gonna give you the arguments, I'm gonna help you or take you through the process of generating those arguments. And third and super importantly, I'm gonna teach you how to not rely on facts because it's really common in debates about animal welfare to just turn them into scientific debates about whether one fact is true or not, except you don't have access to evidence or the internet. So it's really difficult to make these arguments convincing. So it's very common for me to observe a debate about animal testing turn into a scientific debate about whether animal testing is effective or not, or a debate about banning meat consumption on whether meat is required for health. Um, I think that's a really common mistake that debaters make when they approach arguments and topics about animal welfare. And so the focus of this lecture is going to be about how to make arguments based on logic and not just facts. So unlike a lot of other content lectures where, where people you know, teach you about the content or the subject matter, I'm gonna teach you how to debate animal welfare topics and focus a lot less on facts related to animal welfare or good examples you can use in debates. For that, I highly recommend Lewis Bollard's lecture and other content on animal welfare on the internet. But the focus of this lecture is going to be about how to make arguments related to animal welfare. So with that in mind, let me just get to the, the main substance of this lecture. Because I think debates about animal welfare basically tend to come down to three types of clash that it's worth keeping in mind. The first area of clash that you will often encounter in a debate about animal welfare or a debate where animal welfare is a potential argument is why. So why should we care about animal welfare or animals at all? And more specifically, how do the rights that animals may or may not have compare to the rights of people? 
So that's the first question that you will see in a lot of debates about animal welfare. The second is what to care about. So if you do care about animal welfare, what animals? What are your goals for the animals? What's good and what's bad for which animals? And then the third question is how? Because even if you have some goal and you know, for example, that X policy is good for animals, as with any debate about social movements, you also have to think about how you get there, how you convince people that this is the right policy or the right approach in any debate that's adjacent to animal welfare. And I'm gonna structure this lecture by looking at those three different areas of clash that you often encounter in animal welfare debates. I wanna note that many debates will have all three of these questions. Some of them will focus on a handful of these questions. And which questions you choose to focus on in any given debate is up to the debate and a question of debate strategy. So picking a strategy in a debate about animal welfare almost always will involve thinking about which of these three questions is the most important one to answer or the most important one for us to win with our arguments in order to win this debate. So throughout this lecture, I want you to think about these three questions. Why do we care about animals at all slash do we? Second, if we do, what should we care about? And third, how should we get there? Those are the three areas of clash that I think are ubiquitous in debates about animals. So let's start with the first one. Why care about animal welfare? Should animals matter to our decisions at all? And how much relative to people? So this question and this area of clash is especially important in three types of debates. And when I get to any of these three areas of clash, I'm gonna first have a little bit of a chat about strategy. Like what types of debates is this useful in? When should you be thinking about this question or thinking about generating arguments based on this question? And I think there's three types of debates where this question is especially important, which is why care about animal welfare at all? The first and the most common one is the type of topic where helping animals directly trades off against helping humans, or you're asking people to make a sacrifice for animals. So one example of this would be round two of WSTC in 2021. The topic was, this house would ban the production and consumption of meat. So a big chunk of that debate would be the opposition arguing that it is legitimate to consume meat, that the welfare of people who are choosing to consume meat, for example, as a part of their culture is really important and more important than the animals that they are eating. Well, the proposition will try to argue that it is important to help animals and that banning meat helps animals. So that's the most common type of debate where especially opposition teams have to consciously think about, can we challenge that animals matter at all? And what arguments can we make? Well, proposition teams will often think about what arguments can we make to really prove that animals matter, to convince the judge that we should care about their arguments at all. The second type of debate where it's useful is debates about animal advocates as a social movement. So there are many debates which aren't about animal and human rights directly trading off. But even in those debates, it's often a good strategy to challenge whether animals have rights at all, and slash or if you're on the other side, to really ensure that you're defending that animals have rights in the first place. So let me give you two examples of topics like this. The first one is the partial double octo final of WSTC in 2021. The topic read, this house supports a uniform standard for animal welfare, regardless of the perceived utility of an animal to people. So basically some animals are useful to people. For example, uh, people eat chickens or they eat eggs or people wear fur from particular animals or people domesticate particular animals for some use or the other. And other animals are often not especially relevant to people's lives or their decisions. And the topic says, the government's standards on animal welfare should be the same for all types of animals. Here from opposition, like this debate just seems like it's a debate about animal welfare, right? So the proposition maybe says all animals should be equal. The opposition maybe says this lowers the standard too much and we should really ensure that animals are protected differently because some animals suffer more or something. But here it's a very legitimate strategy from opposition to instead make the argument that for some animals, this sets the standard too high. Because if you're applying the same standard of welfare to say a dog and a chicken, presumably you want to care about dogs given that for example, they are pets. But if you apply the standard of welfare to a chicken that could seriously raise the prices of important goods like eggs, and that could seriously hurt people who are dependent on consuming chicken for their lives. And that therefore 
we shouldn't actually care about animal welfare at all when it cuts against human welfare. That's something the opposition might say. And the proposition there might say, well, actually, animals are really important. And here are good reasons why we should care about animal welfare, even in cases where it sometimes conflicts with human welfare. Another example of a topic, which isn't obviously a comparison of animals versus humans, but it's still one where you can introduce the lens of thinking about whether to care about animal welfare at all, is the ESL quarterfinal of EUDC in 2014. And I highly recommend watching this debate because the closing opposition team challenges the existence of animal rights by making some pretty compelling arguments. So the topic there was, this house would require meat packaging, so the packaging of meat products, to include graphic images of animal suffering. So wherever a meat product is on a grocery store, you paste an image of an animal suffering on it, as the and the government requires it. And here, opposition can argue that this would, you know, hurt the meat industry, and this, this would hurt the workers who are producing the meat, consumers who depend on it for their survival, and that's really bad, and we value them more than we value animals. Well, the proposition might have to say something like, here's why the amount of suffering the meat industry inflicts on animals outweighs or is more important than even this. The third type of debate, where it's really important to think about the question of why to care about animal welfare, is debates that seem totally unrelated to animals and animal welfare. So I think as a debater, you should definitely be open, and judges are increasingly open to this, to making arguments about animal welfare, even when the debate looks like it has nothing to do about animal welfare. So in the WSDC format, thinking about how this affects animals is often a good way to make a second speaker argument. In the British parliamentary format, it's often a good way to think about how a closing theme can have an extension. So let me give you some examples of debates that don't seem like they're about animal welfare on face or when you look at them, but where you can still make arguments about animal welfare in a debate that's primarily been about people so far. The first example I can think of is from the 2019 World Universities Debating Championship. The topic was the World Health Organization should basically adopt a ban on the sale of antibiotics to countries which do not follow WHO guidelines regarding their medical and agricultural use. So just to explain that topic a little, the topic says there are antibiotic sales that are happen. And there's a problem where in many cases, antibiotics are overprescribed. So they are overused, for example, doctors prescribe them too much to their patients or animals in farms are injected with tons of antibiotics to prevent disease on farms. The problem though, is the more antibiotics you use, the more bacteria become resistant to them because they evolve to become resistant to antibiotics. So if you overuse them, bacteria will evolve really quickly. And in cases where you actually desperately need antibiotics to save someone's life, the bacteria has evolved so much that it's resistant and you can't save that person's life anymore. <clears throat> so the topic says the WHO has these guidelines that say you can only use this many antibiotics. And if you don't follow those guidelines now, we will just ban selling antibiotics to you. You will lose access to antibiotics. That's the debate. So here it's very possible for the proposition's second speaker to make the following argument. And it's a somewhat complicated argument, so uh, maybe you might want to pay closer attention to this. But the argument is basically farms which raise animals regularly give those animals antibiotics. And the reason for this is that farms have to keep animals in cramped conditions. And if you put a bunch of animals in cramped conditions, then it's very likely that they will spread diseases to each other because it's so cramped, right? But it's really efficient for a farm to keep them in cramped conditions. Farms don't have that much space. They want to get maximum production for their space. And so what farms do, is they pump their animals full of antibiotics. And that's an important contributor to antibiotic resistance. But the argument here is not about antibiotic resistance. So the first speaker will already talk about how antibiotic resistance is really bad, and we need to protect humans from something like a bacterial pandemic. As a second speaker, maybe what you want to say instead is if farms are essentially forced to go without as many antibiotics, 
or to substantially cut their antibiotic use. They're very scared of diseases in the farm because that will ensure that their production goes away. So what they'll do is they'll keep animals in less cramped conditions. And this improves the conditions of animals, which is a really important impact in this debate. Now, if you make an argument like this, this debate has primarily been about people and you're coming in the second speech and making an argument about a pig, right? It kind of sounds ridiculous. So it's really important when you're making an argument like this to spend a lot of time explaining why the welfare of these animals is important enough in this debate that's primarily been about the health of people. And so you need to make arguments for why animals matter, why we should care about animals, and why that's important enough to maybe outweigh some of the opposition's arguments. So another example of a debate where it seems completely unrelated that I'll talk about in more detail later is there are a lot of debates that, for example, say developed countries should try to stop growing their economies. And the, the argument there is maybe rapid economic growth, which is more goods and services being produced, has led to more pollution. Um, it has led to technology becoming potentially unsafe and so on. And so maybe we should stop doing it as developed countries. And that, that's the debate, right? And in such a debate, there is still a possible argument that growing really fast substantially increases the amount of meat that is produced across the world. And that hurts animals. And so we should try not to grow that fast. And I'll go over why this might increase meat production. But the basic reason is that as people grow richer, they are more able to afford and more willing to use their money on meat rather than on crops. And that means that as countries grow faster, there is some evidence, and I'll go over some contradictory evidence later in this lecture, that growing an economy leads to more meat production. And that's an argument for why maybe you should slow down economic growth. I personally disagree with that argument, but it's an argument you can make. So the general point here is you should be willing, especially as a second speaker, to think about making arguments about animal welfare in debates that don't seem to be about animal welfare. But that's another place where the question of why should we care at all about animal welfare becomes important. So given this strategy, let's think about how to debate whether or not to care about animals. Because in all these three types of debates, <clears throat> one important disagreement between the two sides is should we care about animals? And if so, how much? And a lot of this is philosophical. Like we know we care about humans, how different are animals? Do they have some moral value or not? I'm not going to throw a bunch of arguments for why we should and shouldn't care about animals. You can look those up on Google. You can use philosophy encyclopedias. You can just use your own time to think. Instead, what I'm going to do is give you some general principles when trying to generate these arguments about why animals matter or don't matter. So I want to talk about four principles to keep in mind or four rules to keep in mind when deciding how you want to argue that animals matter or don't matter in a debate. The first rule I recommend thinking about is you should always think about compelling analogies. Whenever you make a moral argument that says animals matter for X reason, it's very hard to convince a judge unless you give them an analogy that is an example where they would obviously grant rights to some being and then argue it's similar to animals or where they would obviously not grant rights to some being and then argue it's similar to animals. So one very interesting example of such an analogy is what philosopher Peter Singer calls the argument from marginal cases. And basically the argument goes as follows. There is no actual moral difference between humans and other animals. And the reason is, according to this argument, the only real difference is that humans are much smarter. We are able to communicate. Um, we have complex brains that allow us to think about things like empathy and compassion, which maybe animals don't have. And a lot of people say this is a good reason to deny animals' rights because only humans are deserving of rights. But this argument says there are a lot of humans who don't have these advanced capacities. So one example of this is babies, right? Small babies don't, are not super intelligent. They are roughly similar intelligence to something like a pig or a chimpanzee. So they have similar cognitive capacities, but it's still really bad to not grant infants rights. 
And maybe another example of this is there are some people maybe who have cognitive disabilities that are serious enough that maybe they struggle to communicate or struggle to reason. But that's no reason to not grant them rights. They are also entitled to rights and fairness and justice. And there are counter arguments here. For example, like infants have the potential to grow. People with cognitive disabilities are still more advanced than most animals. And you can argue about these analogies. But that's an example of thinking about an analogy that could potentially compellingly drive home the point that we should care about animals. So that's the first principle I suggest. On either side of the issue of whether we should care about animals or not, try to think of examples or analogies that are useful to advance your side. The second thing that I want to emphasize, the second principle or rule that it's worth noting is <clears throat> always think about related moral principles. So if you've done world schools debate for a while, especially, or if you've been trained in world schools debate, you know that there are lots of arguments, moral arguments that are common that you can apply in many debates. So examples of this include the idea that people are entitled to the freedom of choice or something. You should always think about how you can apply ordinary principles like that to the question of whether we should give animals rights in any debate like this. So let me just give you two simple examples of this. One example of a way you would try to argue for or against um, animal rights is the principle of reciprocity. The principle of reciprocity basically says that if I give you something, you owe me something in return. So if I really make sacrifices to help you, morally, you can't just neglect me when I'm in a time of need. So one argument against granting animals rights that some philosophers have made is that a precondition for having rights is to be able to respect the rights of others. But animals are unable to respect the rights of others. The claim is not that animals are evil. They're literally physically unable to respect the rights of others. And therefore they are not entitled to rights. Another version of the reciprocity argument to justify animal rights is that we depend on animals for a lot of things. And a lot of human actions have done grave harm to animals in order to get us benefit. And therefore we owe it to animals to give them rights given the amount of harm that has been done to them by humans for all this time. So that's just one example of thinking about a related moral principle and applying it to arguing about whether animals have rights or not. So maybe as a task for yourself, when you're thinking about how to make such arguments at home, I will give you two moral principles that are really common. And once this, this session is over, try to think about how you would make arguments based on these moral principles both on the for side and the against side on whether we should care about animals. So one principle is the idea that people are entitled to rights on the basis of their capabilities. So for example, maybe someone who has cognitive disabilities is not given the right to vote, but they are given the right to food security or the right to healthcare. Therefore, we should give rights to people on the basis of what they are capable of experiencing. That's a general principle called the capabilities approach. Think about how you would apply it on either side of a debate about animals. Here's another, the principle of equality. The idea that you don't choose who you are born as, for example, and therefore you are entitled to be treated equally in a society. How can you apply that for and against the question of whether we should give rights to animals? Think about that. The third rule to keep in mind when coming up with arguments for whether you should care about animals or not is do not obsess over fact differences. So a very, as I explained earlier, a really common failure mode in debates about animals is for the debate to really become about facts. And that's especially true when thinking about debates about animal rights or whether animals should matter at all because there'll often be a disagreement between the teams on whether animals can suffer. So one side will say animals can suffer and so animal suffering is really bad. The other will say maybe animals can't experience suffering at all. Now this is just a fact difference and there's no way to Google and resolve the fact. So in cases like this, 
either try to avoid relying on those arguments too much or try to resolve these fact differences analytically. So come up with logical reasons for why it's reasonable to think animals will pain or not experiencing pain. So rather than saying, here's the neurological studies on animals showing that they can experience pain, think of common sense logical reasons that a judge can understand even if they don't have a bio biology degree. So examples of this are, the reason we evolved the ability to feel pain is because <clears throat> if we identify a threat to our health, we have the body sends us a signal that we should avoid it. And pain is an important signal. Like if you go near a fire, it'll hurt. You'll feel the burn. And that is basically the nervous system telling you to avoid it. That's, that, that, that's how evolution produced the notion of feeling pain. And so it's logical that animals would develop this as well and not just humans. So just think about common sense reasons on either side of a fact difference rather than trying to rely on your knowledge of biology or research in the field. Here's the fourth piece of advice. In general, you should not try to hang your hat on making an extreme claim like animal rights literally don't exist or animals don't matter at all. Now, in some cases, it can win a debate. So an example of this is the debate I recommended earlier the ESL quarterfinal of the European Debate Championships in 2014. But it's increasingly becoming harder to win by saying animals just don't matter. So I would instead try a more nuanced approach where what you're trying to do instead is claim that animals matter, they do matter, but they matter less than the rights of people that we are considering in this debate or that they are trading off against. So you should always remember that a debate about animals like this the only reason this question of whether animals matter becomes relevant is because you're trying to argue animals matter less. And so you have to weigh animal rights against the rights of people. If you're on the side that's saying, if you're on the side that's saying animals don't matter as much. So in this case, you should always try to think about how you can, even if you can accept the existence of animal rights, okay? why it is less important than whatever your other concern in the debate is. So let me give you the three most common cases of a trade-off between animals and something that people deserve or that people possess. The first common example and potentially the most challenging one is culture. If you're on the side that's trying to say that people's cultural identity is more important than animals. And remember, there are a lot of debates where you have to make this argument. So one simple example of such a debate is this house would ban uh, sports that involve violence to animals, such as bullfighting. But it also is relevant to much more standard topics, like this house would ban the consumption of meat, because obviously meat is an integral part of people's culture as well. Now, if you're, if you're arguing that the culture of people is more important than animals, if you're on that side of the debate, you can basically use two strategies to try to win this. Or I have two tips that you should keep in mind when making arguments like this. The first is you should always remember the scale of culture. So a common mistake that I see debaters make is when they make an argument that, you know, recognizing this specific right of animals would violate someone's cultural identity. They tend to focus too much on minorities. And don't get me wrong, it's really important to understand the interaction of animal welfare and the experiences of minorities and marginalized groups. But it's also important to remember that in many cases, the cultural identity of nearly everyone is threatened by animal welfare in some cases. So an example of this is in the debate about meat packaging that I discussed earlier, the require meat packaging to include graphic images of animal suffering. On top of the fact that many marginalized groups specifically use meat as a part of their culture, you should always remember that the majority of people, billions and billions of people around the world, see meat as an integral part of their identity and their lives, and use that to outweigh claims about animal welfare. The second tip that I have, if you're weighing culture over animals, is you should try to co-opt the impacts on animals. You should try to say, actually, Respecting culture in the long run helps animals. 
Now you might ask how. The key point is any animal welfare policy affects the perception of the animal advocacy movement. And it's really important if you care about animal rights to ensure that ordinary people are on your side and are not alienated by the actions or decisions of your movement. So for example, if you want to make arguments like, it is really important for animal advocacy groups to work with local communities, especially marginalized people. And in fact, the animal welfare movement has a history, and this is really important information to know. The animal welfare movement has a history of using marginalization for its goals and rather than trying to help out marginalized people. So let me give you some examples of how the animal welfare movement has actually lost the trust of a lot of disadvantaged or marginalized communities. One example is India, which is where I'm from, where a lot of states banned beef on account of the fact that beef is not acceptable according to the majority religion in India, Hinduism. And what that led to is it led to a bunch of things, including lynchings and crimes that targeted the Muslim minority in India on the basis of the fact that the state had sent out a message saying beef eating is morally wrong. However, a lot of animal advocacy groups jumped to endorse these beef bans. For example, PETA India, the vice president of PETA India, wrote an op-ed endorsing these beef bans. And that made a lot of communities in India distrustful of animal advocacy groups. Another example of this is mainstream animal welfare organizations in the United States, like PETA, have often used analogies like slavery um, when advocating against things like zoos. And that's often reduced the trust that members of minority groups in the US have in organizations like PETA in some cases. And so given this history of mistrust, it's important for the animal welfare organization or animal welfare as a movement to not be seen as attacking another group's culture. That's a really important tip because you're not just saying culture is more important than animals. You're saying the animal advocacy movement should not be perceived as attacking culture. And that's a really important tip if you're on the side that's saying culture is more important than the short-term interests of animals. <clears throat> now, if you're on the other side, the easier side in this case, which is saying, like, obviously animal suffering is a bigger problem than culture. So let me just give you some tips here, though I think this is more intuitively doable for most people, including myself. The first is, it's really important to try to get the judge to empathize with what the animal suffering looks and feels like so that you can ensure your outweighing culture. Now, don't be too, too graphic here. You don't want to hurt someone's mental health, but you still want to ensure that you phrase your arguments with examples that really make the judge care about the animals. Because it's really hard to have five logical reasons why animals are more important than culture. And a large part of winning that debate is painting a picture or telling a story of what the animal suffering looks like. The second tip I have is you should always remember that culture can adapt. So you always wanna come up with examples where cultures of many communities successfully adapted to include animals more. And it's really important to sound empathetic to the people whose culture hurts animals. You don't want to paint them as evil because in many cases, these are communities with important cultural practices that they grew up with that it's really hard to separate from. So you should be sensitive while trying to weigh animals over culture and just try to say that it is possible for culture to adapt in a way that includes the people within that culture, but simultaneously doesn't inflict animal suffering. So one example of this is in the debate, this house would adopt an international ban on whaling. So whaling is the practice of hunting whales for their meat. So you might want to use the historical example that in the 1920s, when the gray whale was threatened by endangerment, the Maka people of Washington state an indigenous community in the US gave up whaling. So they reasserted their whaling rights later, but only when the gray whale was moved out of the endangered list. As soon as they became endangered, it was it, the community voluntarily chose to move away from whaling. And so it's possible for culture to adapt without hurting the long-lived traditions of um, 
communities for whom the culture involved some kind of practice that hurt animals. So that's the first category of uh, trade offs where animals trade off against something else. And you're trying to argue either that animals matter more than that something else, or that something else which affects people matters more than animals. That's culture. The second one is a more tangible one, which is food security. So obviously, in many debates related to meat or animals being used for food, there's the lingering question of what will people eat instead? Because for a lot of people, it's, potential, it's possibly true that cheap meat is an important source of sustenance for them. <clears throat> so one side of the debate on food security, you're going to try to argue that meat is a really important way of ensuring people have food on their plates. And here it's important to remember that the other side is going to say, you're just going to replace meat with something else. So you should think about logical reasons, not just fact-based ones, for why it's hard to replace meat um, in people's diets. On the other side, you might actually want to argue that large-scale production of meat is actively harmful for food security. Um, and potentially the reason for that is that it requires twice the resources to produce because you have to feed the animals with crops first and then use land and resources to rear animals to feed humans. And there's other scientific reasons related to things like trophic levels, but in a debate, you're gonna to struggle to explain that to a judge. So you wanna keep it as simple as possible. <clears throat> so that's another trade off, shorter one, because it's just, you just debate, you just think about what the effects of animals on food security is. Third common trade off that you will encounter is economic opportunity. And here there's one important piece of context you need to know. So naturally the debate is going to revolve around something like <clears throat> if a factory farm closes, that's workers laid off. And it's very easy for debaters to just think that argument can be beaten by just saying, well, we're creating jobs in agriculture and crops so workers can go there. But it is true that a farm, for example, might employ more people because you have to actively monitor the animals rather than just use machines and tractors to you know, cultivate crops. And so there's more workers involved in meat production processes and meat packing processes. So here, one important piece of context to remember is that workers in the meat industry, especially in developed countries, face an unusual amount of exploitation. And an important reason for this is the business model, which is that workers in, for example, a company that manufactures chickens operate as contractors. So usually a large company will contract out a couple of farmers to operate a chicken farm out of their property, and they will have to take on the debt themselves and do all of that, but the big company gets a cut of their profits. Um, and so that often means that like, they face like really bad contracts that they struggle to get out of, they are caught in lawsuits with the company, um, and they struggle to meet the strict targets that the company often sets for them. So an important part of working in animal advocacy or making arguments about animal advocacy is thinking about how to rehabilitate these people given both the context that they might not have alternative jobs and the fact that their current job in the meat industry is really exploitative. So one example of an organization that does work on this is the organization Mercy for Animals that actively works with farmers to help them get out of their conditions and in the process help animals. So that's broadly the first question to keep in mind, which is why care about animal welfare? The basic tip that I have is apart from the philosophical arguments about whether to care about animal welfare or not, always remember that this question implies that animal welfare is trading off against some right of humans. And it's important to think about what that trade-off is and how you can make arguments on either side of that trade-off. Cool. So that brings me to the second important area of clash in debates about animal welfare. And that one is what to care about. What actually helps animals? Suppose both sides have agreed that animals are important. What is good and what is bad for animals? <clears throat> and here I want to divide this into two types of animals that are often relevant in debates. Animals within human control, that is animals in captivity and animals in the wild. Let's start with animals in captivity. So here, I think there are basically three important questions 
about animals in captivity that you have to know how to answer from either side in a debate. The first question is, is the current situation of animals in captivity bad? Because a lot of debates will focus on some kind of policy reform. So a simple example of this is this house would ban zoos. It just says zoos should be banned. But the proposition claims that the status quo, the current situation for animals in zoos is really bad. And the opposition says, no, it's actually not that bad. And basically any debate about animal farming to some extent will have this clash where one side claims it's a lot worse than the other side does. But the problem is much bigger. So in thinking about how to establish whether a problem exists and how big that problem is, there are two categories of arguments to keep in mind. The first one is arguments based on incentives. So you should always press yourself to think about what the incentives of a zoo or a farm are. Do they want or do they have self-interested reasons that would end up substantially hurting animals? So with farms, here are some examples of incentives that farms might have that end up causing them to hurt animals. Because the farmers are not evil people who are trying to hurt animals. The claim is that animals are hurt in the process of growing up in a farm. And you might come up with reasons like, first, the fact that they have limited space and they want to make the most use out of that space means they cram animals in close conditions. Second, the fact that they want to cut costs means that they deprive animals of their basic needs. For example, not giving pigs enough mud to engage in mud baths, that's really important to keep them mentally healthy. Third, the fact that there are different parts in the production process, meaning you have to transport animals that adds to the amount of stress that they face. Fourth, the fact that in many cases, there is an active consumer interest to get a particular type of animal product that ends up hurting the animal. For example, Consumers who want to eat chicken expect really fatty wings. And that means that you have to raise varieties of chickens, broiler chickens that are slow growing, that are, that are rapidly growing. So they grow really fast and they grow really big. The problem is if they grow really big, the rest of their physiology is not prepared to handle it. So they get fractures because their legs can't support their body weight and so on. And then on the other side, you might say stuff like, there is strong consumer backlash that is pressuring farms to reform. That farms have an incentive to not cause animals injuries because an injured animal is a worse piece of meat. So you should always be thinking about from either side, what selfish interests do the farms have that either hurt or help the animals? Or what selfish interests do the zoos have that either hurt or help the animals? So it's worth abstracting away from arguments like farms are just evil or farms are just good people. And instead think about what they are looking for that's often independent of the animal and what the side effect of that on the animal is when trying to think about whether the current situation is bad or not, whether there is a problem to solve in the first place. The second category of argument to think about when thinking about whether there is a problem to solve is what the counterfactual is. So that is what would happen to the animals instead? Like suppose the animals were not in farms, what would happen to them? Like they would not exist in the first place. So one really common mistake that I've seen new debaters do is they will make arguments like animals will be better off in the wild than in farms. But obviously if, for example, on the topic, this house would ban the consumption of meat. If the farm is shut down, then they will just not breed the animals because animals are bred for meat. And so the animals won't exist in the first place. Now, let me give you three examples of debates where the counterfactual, what happens instead, is actually an argument for why maybe that isn't a problem or why the proposition makes the problem worse. The first example of this is on the debate, this house would ban hunting. So the hunting of animals for sport. In that debate, the proposition will say it's wrong to kill animals. It's wrong to hurt them, to cause them so much fear and stress in the process of the pursuit, and then to kill them. And here it's possible for the opposition to say, but the lives of animals in the wild, if they weren't hunted, are really bad anyway. Most animals die painful deaths anyway, and so maybe hunting isn't that bad. And you make the debate about that. 
And of course, that's not an obvious fact. I'm not saying it's a fact. I'm just saying it's an argument. <clears throat> but that's an example of thinking, not just thinking what is the direct effect of hunting, but also thinking what would happen if hunting stopped. So two other examples on topics we've discussed before. On the topic, this house would ban the production and consumption of meat. One important argument the opposition will make is that people will want meat anyway. They'll just do it illegally through the black market where there's no regulation at all to protect animals. Similarly, on the debate, this house would require graphic images of animal suffering on meat packaging. So often proposition will set up the debate such that they take pictures of the farm itself. So whatever farm is selling the meat, they take pictures of how the animal's conditions are in that farm and put it on the meat package. That creates an incentive, according to the proposition, for farms to improve. So here the opposition can say, there are lots of ways of killing animals that are really painful, but don't look painful. For example, injecting them with a toxin that slowly kills them. But they don't look painful, and so the image doesn't look nearly as bad to a consumer. So that's another example of thinking about if this policy that the proposition wants does not happen, what would happen instead? And how do we compare those two possibilities? So that's the first question about animals in captivity. Is there a problem? When thinking about whether there is a problem, think about the incentives of the actors involved and what would happen to the animals instead. The second question about animals in captivity is which animals should we care about? Because it's very clear that there are some animals in captivity that are more or less important than others. I would broadly use four criteria when thinking about which animals to care about. And there's lots of debates where this is relevant. For example, and I will go over this topic in more detail soon, but on the topic that animal advocates should work very closely with environmental activists in their pursuit of animal advocacy or topics of that kind. An important line of argument you want to make is the animals which suffer most and need the most protection, which is the focus of animal activists, are not necessarily the animals that cause the most pollution that is the focus of the environmental activists. For example, chickens suffer a lot, but cattle which suffer less on beef farms cause more pollution. So it's often important in debates to think about which animals are the important or the relevant ones. And I suggest using four criteria to think through which animals are the most important or relevant, at least with a focus on animal welfare. So I'm not considering other criteria here, I'm just thinking about animal welfare. The first is obviously how smart or how self-aware and capable of understanding suffering animals are. And here it's broadly just worth remembering that Cattle and pigs are especially smart as far as farmed animals go, while maybe chickens and fish are relatively less smart. Their brains are less developed. The second criterion is the size of the animal. Why does the size of the animal matter? Because <clears throat> for the same amount of meat, for example, or the same amount of fur or the same amount of leather, if there is a large animal, you need to kill way fewer to get the same amount. Whereas if there's a small animal, you have to kill a lot of them. So an example of this again, is that for one kilogram of beef, doesn't even require killing a whole cow yet. Or like killing a whole cow produces many kilograms of beef. But one kilogram is like only slightly under the weight of a full chicken. The third question is how much does the animal suffer in the farm? And here I encourage you to look things up and read about what incentives are there to treat different animals differently. So one example of an incentive-based argument for why one animal suffers more than any other is that egg-laying chickens, so chickens that are raised for eggs and not for their meat, tend to suffer more in farms than chickens that are raised for their meat. And one important reason why is an injury in a chicken that is raised for meat damages the quality of the meat. But something like a bruised wing in a chicken that is raised for eggs doesn't damage the eggs at all. And so that's less of an incentive to care about preventing injuries in birds that are raised for eggs. 
And then the fourth and final criterion to use is the counterfactual. What would happen to that animal instead? So a good example here is that across the world, there is a growing trend of fish consumption moving more toward farmed fish. That is fish that are bred for their meat as opposed to wild caught fish, which is fish caught from the ocean. But wild caught fish in many cases, even if they hadn't been caught, unfortunately in the wild, in the ocean, they would die painful deaths anyway, for example, by being predated upon. Whereas a farm fish wouldn't exist in the first place. And it's just being brought into a life of torture. And therefore, the adoption of farmed fish over wild caught fish, according to many animal activists, is a bad thing. So that's the second question about animals in captivity. Which animals in captivity are especially important? The third question about animals in captivity is whether it is better for the animals for us to either not kill them at all or just improve their conditions. So this is a very classic debate topic that you will encounter a lot, which is whether we should prefer a world where we just stop killing animals or whether we should prefer a world where we continue using animal products, but the animals are treated much more humanely. So here, there are obvious arguments for why it would be better to not kill animals at all. But here are two arguments that you can use <clears throat> for why maybe not killing animals at all is worse for the animals than raising them in humane farms. First, if tomorrow people stopped eating meat altogether, there would be a lot of animals left over in farms. And those animals would have to be disposed of. But if you're disposing of them, you don't care about whether killing them in a painless or clean way to ensure that the meat is safe. And so you end up culling them often in incredibly painful ways. The second type of argument you can make here is if you successfully manage to change the farming system such that animals are treated humanely, and remember, currently in farms, very hard to argue animals are treated humanely in the real world. But if you manage to reach a world where animals are treated humanely in farms, maybe, just maybe, even if they are killed at the end of it, their life in the farm is a good life and a life worth having, and it's worth them existing. That's a strange, weird argument. I don't recommend making it in all cases, but it's an argument that exists. Again, this is all about a hypothetical. We are comparing two hypothetical worlds, one where no animals are killed and one where animals are killed humanely. In the real world, in all likelihood, animals in farms are treated very, very badly. And so in this debate, both sides agree that, we, that the status quo is horrible in this specific debate. And the only question is how to change it. So those are the four questions related to animals in captivity that I think come up in debates a lot. Now let's move on to animals in the wild. Now for animals in the wild, one common debate related to animals in the wild or common type of debate related to animals in the wild is debates about how we conserve endangered species. So a lot of species are going extinct in the wild and that is potentially a bad thing. So how do we prevent that? So one common type of debate related to conservation of species is about whether you want to focus on for-profit approaches or non-profit approaches to helping conserve endangered species. In fact, that was almost exactly the wording of round six of WSTC in 2017. I'm sure there's a video you can look up to watch that debate. But there are also other debates that follow this theme. An example of this is this house would ban trophy hunting. So trophy hunting is like hunting animals for trophies that you collect from the dead animals. And the opposition in this debate that says trophy hunting should not be banned will make an argument that says <laughs> if there is a big for-profit industry of hunting where people pay in order to hunt animals for their entertainment, that creates an incentive to conserve animals. Because if an animal goes extinct, you lose your profits. So in fact, hunting helps the conservation of species. And then the other side will say, no, actually, 
because you're often killing keystone species. There are species that are important for the rest of the environment. Hunting endangers the species faster. So one common type of debate, which you have to think about, is what is better for conserving animal species, for-profit or non-profit approaches. And I think that's the most common conservation-related debate you will get. <clears throat> but I want to make another note that's really important. Conservation is not the same as welfare. In fact, in many instances, not all of them, not even most of them, but some of them, it's possible that conservation ends up hurting animal welfare. And trophy hunting is a classic example. Because if it is true that hunting is really bad for the animal, it may or may not be true, but if it is true, then even if trophy hunting conserves the species, because whatever company that has tourists and gets them to hunt in Kenya, invests in the species' conservation, so more of its tourists can hunt, each individual animal suffers a lot in the process of hunting. And there are other examples of this. Like whenever there is an invasive species, for example, a species that is uh, taking up a lot of territory and slowing down the reproduction of another species that's been there in a territory a lot, conservationists will often advocate culling, that is mass killing the invasive species in the wild. So that's an example of trying to conserve another species, but in the process, reducing animal welfare. So there is one approach to conservation called compassionate conservation. So compassionate conservation tries to ensure that conservation happens without harming animals. So one example of this is in a small Australian island, there are these rare species of penguins that are being predated upon by foxes. And a lot of conservationists therefore advocated just killing the foxes because foxes are not endangered. So even if we kill some foxes, it's not gonna threaten the species. So they kill the foxes and the rarer penguins survive. And here, one of the two animals is going to die and conservationists prioritize the rarer one. But a compassionate conservationist, someone working in compassionate conservation, might instead advocate to install guard dogs that look after the penguins, thus directly hurting neither the fox nor the penguin. But there's also a broader movement of people that is rising right now, admittedly a small movement, that says the lives of animals in the wild are often really bad. Sometimes this is the result of human action. For example, we, can, we often use pesticides that cause frogs to die painful deaths when we could just use, for a slightly higher cost, a better pesticide. But in other cases, it's just nature being brutal. So for example, lots of animals starve to death in the wild. And in this case, what can we do to help them? And there is a school of people that believes we should intervene in the wild for example, by feeding animals in the wild in order to help them. Other people believe that interventions in the wild are dangerous because they could have dangerous side effects. For example, if we feed animals too much, maybe they become dependent on human feed and don't know how to find food for themselves. Or maybe we accidentally grow the population of an animal species like deer too much, and then they starve themselves to death by eating all the crops that are there. So there's lots of second and third order side effects to keep in mind, but that's also a topic of debate that might come up. And here's an example of a debate where this exact thing becomes important. So this is the Saskatoon WSTC semifinal, a Canadian debate tournament earlier this year. And the topic was, if you are an animal activist and you're choosing to dedicate your career either to helping farmed animals and there's already an established field of helping farmed animals. We know there are organizations like PETA that are dedicated to helping farmed animals. Or should you instead join an organization, a very new organization focused on helping wild animals? Not necessarily by directly intervening, but for example, by doing research to understand whether wild animals suffer or not. 
this field is much newer. It's not well established. There's only a couple million dollars going into it every year. Which of these two should a single animal activist do? So in that debate, one part of the debate will be thinking about whether wild animals suffer much. And if they do suffer, again, with logical reasons, not with facts. And if they do suffer, what can we do about it? So one logical reason, for example, for why wild animals might suffer more is that a lot of small animals, right? It makes sense for small animals to reproduce in such a way that they have lots of offspring and don't put much attention into caring for any of the offspring. So say 80% of the offspring die, but 20% remain and they continue to propagate their species. Evolution would find that very efficient because it's like with low effort from each parent, you're able to get a lot of return in terms of offspring. However, in the process, the majority of the offspring die, often painful deaths. So that's one reason for why a lot of small wild animals lead lives of suffering. And it's all about coming with logical reasons like this to compare the experiences of wild and farmed animals. So that's one question you ask in the debate. Whose experiences are worse? Which problem is more important? The second question you'll ask in that debate is, which problem is more solvable? So for example, if it is true that wild animals have very little of a focus on them, so there's very few resources spent on them and very few people who are actually investing in them, then one side might say, you don't have, you, you, you barely have an organization. How can a person have an impact working here? They don't have resources, they don't have money. What impact can you have on animals? And the other side says, it's precisely when you have nothing that each additional person is so useful because you barely can run an organization, especially if it's a new organization in the field or when it's just starting out as a new field. And so you desperately need more people working on it. So those are two areas of clash that come to mind when you're thinking about prioritizing farm animals and wild animals. But I think it's a more general theme in debates about animal welfare. Because like any other social movement, animal welfare has to decide where its resources are going. And when comparing two different places for these resources to go, you should always think about how important the problem is, but also whether you can solve the problem. So that's the second area of clash, what to care about. Now and finally, let's get to the third area of clash, how to help animals. And here I've noticed that debates generally come of two types. The first type of debate is about whether to use a moderate approach or an extreme approach as the animal welfare movement. So one example of this is in animal welfare, in the whole animal welfare community. There is a whole debate between abolitionism. So abolitionism says that animals are entitled to rights and we should aim to abolish their use by humans for anything. And welfareism, which says we should just try to incrementally improve the conditions of animals. So this comes back to the topic we discussed earlier about whether animal activists should look for a world where we stop killing or using animals for human purposes at all, or instead for a world where animals are just treated humanely. And here it's worth thinking about two questions that you might not think about in other debates of this kind. One of them is there is actually an open debate about whether welfare reforms are good or bad for animals. Some people argue that if you impose an animal welfare regulation that just tries to improve the animal's welfare without trying to get us to an animal exploitation free society. For example, you say, you know, all chickens that are raised for meat in developing countries should be raised without cages. Because unlike in developed countries, in developing countries, chickens that are raised for meat, not just eggs, are often kept in cages. And one side might say, in fact, 
if you abolish cages, that will make more people comfortable with buying chicken at the store because they don't feel as guilty about it anymore. And so by improving the animal's conditions, you inadvertently increase the demand for meat and therefore increase the number of animals that had to experience bad conditions. And then there's another side which says, actually, if you force a regulation on companies that says they have to abandon cages or something, that makes it more expensive for companies to produce meat, and so they cut back on their production. So that's a common debate which happens. And then obviously there's the underlying point that improving the welfare is a good thing itself. So a chicken without cages is still better than a chicken with cages. The second thing, and this is a more common theme in social movement debates, but it's still relevant here, that you'll do when faced with this clash of should we abolish the use of animals entirely or focus on improving their welfare, is the question of whether, which is more effective. So obviously one side will say, there will be significant backlash if you just say, you know, we expect you to abolish meat entirely. The public won't like it. You won't convince anyone. But the other side can actually say, taking this extreme stance is actually good to convince people because it changes people's expectations of how to treat animals. It has a psychological effect where if you have an extreme voice out there saying any animal exploitation is bad, <clears throat> that psychologically makes someone who's just saying we should improve animal welfare a little bit seem more reasonable. So that's an important psychological aspect of what's called the Overton window effect or pushing the Overton window, which is having an extreme voice there makes moderate voices in the animal welfare movement seem more reasonable and they work to complement each other. The second category of debate under moderate versus extreme approaches by the social movement is literally what physically should the social movement do? So one common motion that you will likely encounter is that <coughs> animal activists should use violence. So animal rights groups should be open to um, using things like, uh, you know, violent methods. They should be willing to break the law and they should be willing to, for example, break into factory farms in order to free animals. That's called open rescue animal activism and so on. So the way to approach those debates is actually quite similar to how you approach the abolition versus welfare debate. Because the way you approach the debate is essentially a clash between one side that says this causes a lot of anger against the animal movement and the other side saying this makes moderates in the animal movement look more reasonable. And then finally, the third category of debate in terms of moderate versus extreme solutions is about the role of guilt in animal advocacy. Should animal advocates make ordinary people feel bad about their treatment of animals? For example, should people who are advocating that people turn vegan say you are immoral if you don't, or should they instead be encouraging and try to work with people to make small changes to their diet? Another example of this is the debate we discussed earlier on whether meat packaging should have graphic images of animal suffering on it. So in this debate, you basically have to think about two things. One of them is the role of guilt. So does guilt and feeling guilty make people not associate good things with the animal movement? Does it make them feel like they don't want to be associated with the animal movement at all? Or does it make them feel bad and make them feel like, wow, this is horrible. I'm a horrible person and I need to change my ways. The second though is, is making consumers feel guilty. Does it sensitize them? So make them feel bad and you know have an emotional response, for example, by showing them a graphic picture of an animal? Or does it instead desensitize them? 
where once they're constantly exposed to something like a graphic picture of an animal, they get used to it and stop thinking about it or try to avoid thinking about it at all. So those are somewhat similar questions, but those are two questions that the clash will often focus on when the debate is about whether you should present animal welfare as a person's obligation and they are bad people for not approaching animal welfare this way, or instead as simply an opportunity for them to do a little good in their life. The second category of debate is about who to focus on when trying to convince people to help animals. Should we focus on changing government policy? Should we focus on corporate reforms? So changing company actions, or should we focus on consumers? So the most common trade-off that is faced in these debates is one side will say, our solution is a more long-term one. So for example, changing a government and changing a government's approach to animals lasts much longer than convincing a few consumers to become vegetarian. In contrast, the other side will say, even if our method of change is not as long-term, it is much easier. For example, it's easier to change a few consumers' minds than to lobby a whole government. So let me just go through how to approach building arguments on either side of this long-term versus short-term debate. <clears throat> so on the short-term side, that's saying we want short-term change. And we, we're not looking for long-term change, we're looking for simple change. There are two arguments that help you co-opt the benefits of the other side. One of them is that it's really important for the animal movement to have early success because that builds traction, that builds buzz, that makes people talk about the animal movement and participate in the animal movement a lot more. The second argument that says actually a short-term approach is better is that short-term success, changing the minds of people leads to institutional change in the long-term. Because if you convince a bunch of people that animals matter, they will change the way they vote or they will pressure corporations literally by changing what they buy. So in the long term, changing the minds of a couple of people can, is the best path to changing governments and changing corporations. <clears throat> and then on the other side, the arguments are more straightforward. You say things like, um, it is harder for people to just get used to your movement because once you've locked in a government law, it's hard to change it. Or it's, easier for us to have a legitimizing effect where the government embracing animal welfare sends a message to everyone that animal welfare is something to take seriously. The final thing that I want to talk about in this lecture is even if you settle on changing the minds of consumers, there are two different ways to change consumer behavior and animal advocacy. One of them is by directly talking to them and changing their mind. The other is through innovation, by giving them alternatives that make them not want to consume animal products. So the standard example of this innovation is substitutes for meat, alternative proteins, clean meat as it's called. And here there are two main approaches. One of them is um, basically trying to replicate what real meat is like through plants. For example, by using proteins that are found in soybean. And that's the approach taken by companies like Impossible Foods. And the other is to literally grow meat using animal cells. For example, in a lab, that's called cultivated meat or cultured meat. Now, the advantage of an innovation-based approach is that in the long run, it's possible to argue that innovation permanently replaces animal farming. And the reason it does that is it might actually become more profitable in the long term. And here's why. Now, only some parts of an animal are eaten, right? Not, the whole animal is not eaten in most cultures. However, you're growing the whole animal by breeding a whole animal and feeding it. But with something like cell-based meat, you can just grow artificially the parts of the meat that people will eat, like just grow a wing. 
or you can just develop the equivalent of that using the soybean protein. And so that takes less resources to do because you don't have that much waste, not nearly as much waste as you do in the production of animals in farms. However, on the other side, you'll note that there are two main challenges. One of them is the price is higher because this is new innovation, it's new technology, and therefore it's costly and no one is willing to subsidize it. Whereas real meat, for example, is subsidized by the government. The second, is people just don't believe it's real meat. So even if you get super, super accurate with it, people get a different psychological experience out of eating it rather than eating real meat or eating or consuming real animal products. And therefore they choose the latter route. And that means it's really hard to get people to agree with your innovation. So that's all I have for this lecture. But I think the ultimate takeaway is that the animal advocacy movement is like any other social movement except it's in a social movement that's in a very special place. And I really think, therefore, it's important to not let debates about animal welfare to simply turn into debates that disagree about the facts of what animals do, and instead to really think about why you should care about animal welfare, what helps animals analytically, and what strategy, therefore, social movements surrounding animals should employ. And I think that's what most animal welfare debates come down to. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think we're gonna stop the stream right here, um, just because we don't, we're not sure if people